الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We move on to hadith number 97 of this blessed book of Umdatul Ahkam and the hadith was narrated by Ubadah ibn al-Samit may Allah be pleased with him he said that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there is no salat for one who does not recite the mother of the book. And the mother of the book, it was translated here to be the essential chapter that is Al-Fatiha. There is no salat. What does that mean? This is a negation. And in the hadiths of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and before that, in the Quran, negation can be used to say that there is nothing existing. As we say, la ilaha. There is no God worthy of being worshipped. Illa Allah. So we negate something, we say that it does not exist. There is no one in the house. Meaning, there is no person in the house. Also, negation can mean to negate something out of perfection so someone says did you work out today in the gym i said i did not work out but i went for 10 minutes so by saying i did not work out i do not mean that i did not go to the gym i mean that it wasn't the perfect workout that i usually have and we have a number of evidences for example when the prophet says alayhi salatu was salam لا إيمان لمن لا أمانة له. A person who does not have honesty, he has no iman. Does this mean he's kafir? When the prophet says لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. One of you would not believe until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. When he said لا يؤمن does this mean that he's not a believer? He's a kafir? Scholars said no. This means that it is not the perfect iman. And this is the difference between us and the deviant groups. We who follow the methodology, the manhaj of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we believe that iman increases with good deeds and decreases with bad deeds or with sins. The deviant groups don't look at it this way. Deviant groups like who? Like Al-Khawarij or like Al-Murji'ah. Both of them are deviant on different extremes. Khawarij saying that Iman is a full unit. Murji'ah are also saying Iman is a full unit. How can that be? They say that Iman does not increase. Either it's there all the way or it's out all the way. And that is why Al-Khawarish say, if you make a major sin, you've nullified your Iman. You're kafir and you're in hell forever. Any major sin. And that is why Al-Murji'a say, no matter what sins you do, major, minor, as long as you don't associate others with Allah, you are a full-fledged mu'min. And you are in paradise with Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. So they both went into extremes, though the same concept is there, which is Iman does not increase and does not decrease. The believers don't believe in this. Those who are Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they believe that it is increased by good deeds and decreased by sins. And that is why it fluctuates the level of Iman. And that is why the Iman is 70 plus branches. Meaning that if I have 20 branches, I'm a believer. But I still have 50 plus 2 complete and become a true full-fledged believer and that is why when we look at some of the hadiths you have to be careful you don't take one hadith or one verse or one set of evidence and neglect the others this is not the doing of a proper student of knowledge this is the doing of the people of innovation the deviant sects they take one verse and that is it Khalas. Okay, but there are other verses that can make you understand this verse better. No, 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 I need only this. And when you go to this hadith, 
The Prophet says, لا صلاة. There is no prayer. So what does the Prophet mean? Other example. لا صلاة لمن لا وضوء له. There is no prayer for someone who does not have wudu. Is this specifying that the prayer is incomplete or the prayer is invalid? It is invalid. Definitely, you all know this, obviously. Likewise, when we come to this hadith, scholars differed. But they all agreed that whoever does not recite al-Fatiha, if he's an individual, then his prayer is invalid. With the exception of al-Hanafi school of thought. Because they thought that, no, it is sufficient to read a portion of the Qur'an, one eye of the Qur'an, not necessarily al-Fatiha. But this is an exception that we would neglect because we have the hadith supporting it. So the majority say, reciting the Fatiha is a must if you are an individual or if you are an imam. And they differ whether it is a must for you if you are a follower or not. We will come to this, inshallah, later on. لا صلاة لمن لم يقرأ To those who do not recite. أم الكتاب أم means mother. الكتاب is the Quran, the book. So does this mean أم الكتاب, the mother of the book? And does the, the, the book has a father? What, what does this mean? No, in Arabic, أم, when used with something, meaning that it is the reference and the prominent thing. So when we say, for example, in describing Mecca, what do we call it? Ummul Qura, as described in the Quran. What does Ummul Qura mean? It doesn't mean the mother of all villages. It means a prominent among all villages and cities and countries. It is the head. When we say, I hit him on Ummu Ra'sih. Um Ra'sih. What do they mean? They mean that this area which holds all of the head. The skin that holds all of the head. So, um is used with a lot of things. We have the phrase of the mother of all battles, ummul ma'arik. Not that it is the mother. It means that it's, a, it's the prominence. It's the battle of all battles. And likewise. And we know that the Fatiha is the greatest surah in the Quran. No surah is similar to it. And... We know that it has a number of names. Al-Hasan al-Basri, may Allah have mercy on his soul, one of the great tabi'een, stated that there were 400 sacred books. All of them were summarized and composed in Torah, Injil, Zabur. And all of these books were summarized and summoned in Al-Quran. And the whole of the Quran was summarized in the greatest chapter, which is Al-Fatiha. Some of the names of Al-Fatiha is Umm Al-Kitab, Al-Fatiha, Al-Shafiya, Al-Kafiya, Al-Salat, Ruqya, because the Prophet Islam considered to be Ruqya as well, and so many other names, a lot of names the, the, the authors and the uh, scholars have compiled to show us that how great this surah is. And it's the habit of Arabs, whenever they glorify something or whenever something is of importance, that they give it a lot of names. That is why we have so many names for Allah Azza wa Jal. The one we know of is 99 names. Whoever memorizes them and understands their meaning and calls Allah by them will enter Jannah as in the, in the hadith. Man ahsaha, dakhal al Jannah. Also, there are Lots of names for hell. Fire, for example. So many names in the Quran mentioned. And so many names for paradise. And so many names for so many things. The sword, for example, has a number of names. Because the more the thing is valuable and prominent, the more names it has. Now, we come to the ruling on reciting the Fatiha. We've stated before that it is a pillar of prayer to recite the Fatiha. And without it, your prayer is invalid, la salat. However, 
Yeah, the difference among scholars is great when it comes to the follower, the ma'mum, the person following his imam in prayer. Is he supposed to read the Quran or recite the Fatiha or not? We have a number of evidences, and these evidences, if we apply a portion of them, meaning that we have to cancel the other portion. So, you remember, when we have conflicting evidences, the highest and best level is to join and combine. Why? Because we're applying both evidences. If we are unable, we have to look at the date so that we would say that the latest abrogates the earliest. If we are unable, then we have to authenticate and see which of the evidences is more authentic and higher in grade and degree than the other, and we take that. If not possible, we abstain, we stop and say, I do not know how to combine these conflicting evidences, but I believe that there are scholars who know, I'll wait until they tell me. And this is a sign of respect to the evidences that are conflicting. I would not accuse my mind and say, these evidences are wrong. I will not accuse these evidences. I will accuse my mind and say that I am unable to understand how to combine between them. We have a short break. Stay tuned, and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. La salata liman lam yaqra bi ummi al kitab. There is no prayer for those who do not recite the Fatiha. So, what is the ruling on reciting the Fatiha? As stated before, it is a pillar of prayer for those who are leading the Imam and for those who are praying individually on their own. But the scholars differed regarding the Ma'mum, the one who is praying behind the Imam. And the reason of their difference of opinion is the evidences we have. On one hand, we have this hadith, la salat, there is no prayer valid. So they've applied this to all types of worshippers, whether you're an individual, imam, or a follower. And they have another hadith, those who say, no, you don't recite it, such as the recitation of the imam is a recitation to those behind him. And another hadith or ayah that when the Qur'an is being recited, you must listen to it and pay attention. And a third hadith that both are using, both parties, is the hadith of Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, that they prayed once with the Prophet والسلام, a loud prayer. And after the Prophet والسلام, finished praying, he said, did you recite Qur'an with me? And they said, yes. The Prophet said, do not recite Qur'an except Umm al-Kitab, only the Fatiha, nothing else. And after that, in the same hadith, Abu Huraira says, and after a while, the people were denied even that. This is his exact words. So some scholars say the people have been denied even that means that even Fatiha don't recite it. So when you look at the conflicting evidences, you don't know which one to follow. That is why Abu Hanifa led, may Allah have mercy on his soul, a group of scholars saying that the Ma'mum does not recite anything, whether it's a loud prayer or silent prayer, because the Imam's recitation is sufficient for him. The other part or the other portion of scholars were led by Imam al-Bukhari, the compiler of the Sahih, who wrote a chapter on this, saying that it is mandatory for you to recite the Fatiha in all rak'ahs, regardless of your status, individual imam or a follower. And they kept on pulling and pushing each other until Al-Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy on his soul, came and looked at all the evidences and he wrote a small book it is found in Arabic, I don't know if it's translated into English, it's called Al-Ilmam Bihukm Al-Qira'ati Khalf Al-Imam The acquiring of knowledge 
regarding the ruling of the recitation behind the Imam. And throughout his small booklet or research, he concluded that in silent prayers, it is a must that a follower recites the Fatiha. And if he doesn't, his prayer is invalid. So it is a pillar upon a person in silent prayers or in silent rak'ah, as in the third and the fourth rak'ah of Isha, for example, or the third rak'ah of Maghrib. These are silent rak'ahs in loud prayers. And he said that in loud prayers, in the first and second rak'ah of Fajr, Maghrib, and Isha, when the Imam is reciting loudly, he said it is recommended to recite the Fatiha, but it is not mandatory. It is recommended because the hadiths support this, but it is not mandatory because of the hadith of Abu Hurairah, when the Prophet said, and the people were forbidden to do that afterwards. And by this, you apply all a hadith. So hadiths like, La salata liman lam yaqra, there's no prayer for those who do not recite the Fatiha, we understand it in the light of if a person is an imam, if a person is an individual, or if a person is a follower reciting a silent rak'ah. And the other hadiths, we understand it to be in loud prayers where it is recommended, but it is not mandatory. And with this, all evidences are being applied. And inshallah, this is the most authentic opinion of scholars. However, is it permissible for the imam to have a pause after reciting the Fatiha and saying غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِ مُرَضَّالِينَ آمين. And he waits for 20 seconds, 15 seconds so that the followers would recite the Fatiha? No, this is not permissible. It is not part of the Sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ never paused between the Fatiha and the Surah. He immediately recited the Surah after the Fatiha without leaving a pause. So if I were to recite the Fatiha, if I wanted to recite it, just to be on the safe side. When do I recite it? Scholars say you can recite it when the Imam is not speaking. So if the Imam is reading a surah and between the verses he has a short pause, you, the minute he finishes the ayah, you say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. He goes on reciting an ayah, he pauses, you say, Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. Or you read it and recite it even if he's reciting the Quran. And this is an exception from فَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنَ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْصُتُوا Because it is, to a number of scholars, mandatory for you to recite the Fatiha. If you want to recite it, there is no problem, but you have to do this either when the Imam pauses or when there is a possibility to recite it while the Imam is reciting. We take your questions if you have any. Yes, brother. Question is related to hadith number 93. I have heard a ruling, if a woman crosses in front of you while praying, prayer is invalid. Is this woman mature or immature? Second, is she non-mehram or any woman? Regarding the passing of women in front of a worshipper, does it void or nullify prayer or not? We will come to this, inshallah, very soon. So we will not address this issue, whether it is a woman who reached the age of puberty or not, definitely. A young girl does not nullify your prayer. Whether she is a mahram or non-mahram, any woman nullifies her prayer if she passes in front of you. But this we will come, inshallah, to explain a little bit into more details. Yes, brother. Uh, I want to ask that, can we close our eyes in Salah? This is a good question. What's the ruling on closing the eyes in Salat? Scholars differed. Some say it's completely forbidden and prohibited because this is the doing of Sufis. And others say, no, it's permissible because nothing to prevent it. And the best answer would be if there is a need for it and it is not a custom that a person does every prayer, it is permissible. Meaning, if I'm praying and in front of me, on this particular prayer, there is a child who is dancing breakdance. And if I open my eyes, he's in front of me, and I'm watching him, I might laugh, I might do something. So it is permissible because this is not the norm. So it's an, a separate incident, not something that's every time taking place. This is permissible if there is something that is distracting me. 
But if it's every prayer and shaitan comes to you and say, you will not have khushur, you will not have concentration until you close your eyes. This was not done by our Prophet, Islam, nor by companions, so it would be considered an innovation. Uh, Sheikh, as you mentioned that uh, the namaz uh, salat is invalid if you don't recite Surat al fatiha But uh, in certain remote villages, people are so illiterate, forget about reading or writing. They are not even in a position to memorize this uh, Surat al fatiha So rather than reciting the Surat al fatiha if they say some glorifying words about Allah, like say, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Wallahu Akbar, is the namaz valid and acceptable to Allah? If a person does not know Fatiha, he has to memorize forms of glorification of Allah, such as Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar, La ilaha illallah, wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, as the Prophet has taught us, alayhi salam. But to say that in rural areas, in remote villages, people are so ignorant that they don't know the Fatiha, the Fatiha does not take more than one day to learn. So they must learn it. If they do not learn it and they don't want to learn it, their prayer is invalid and they're not considered to be Muslims. But if a person is so illiterate, so incapable of memorizing it, and he says, I tried. It's, it's been three years. I've been trying to recite the Fatiha. I can't. And Allah knows that he cannot. In this case, Allah Azza wa would not burden a soul above its capacity or capability. Yet, it's very difficult that people cannot memorize the Fatiha, which is very short, very sweet, very easy. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ Allah has made the Qur'an easy for those to recite and memorize, etc. Abdurrahman. Sheikh, I've heard of narrations where it says that uh, one of the Sahabi, he came and, you know, he got the Salah in the Ruku. They will say that the one who gets the Ruku has got the pillar or the raka. So what is your opinion in that regarding Surat Al-Fatiha? The very good question. The consensus of scholars is that if you enter the masjid and the Imam is in the state of Rukur, the Fatiha is not mandatory upon you. Why? Because of the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, that when any one of you come to the masjid and the Imam is in the position of Rukur, he should offer the Rukur as well. And also in the hadith of Abu Bakr al thaqafi may Allah be pleased with him, when he entered the masjid and he found the Prophet ﷺ bowing alongside with all the other companions. So at the gates, he said, Allahu Akbar, and he bowed. He didn't recite the Fatiha. And he walked bowing until he was in the row. After the Prophet finished the prayer, ﷺ, he asked, who did this? Abu Bakr said, I. The Prophet said, may Allah increase in your enthusiasm, in your effort to follow the prayer, but do not do it again. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have. Until we meet next time, fi amanillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.